Yep. What is the rest of that 256 bytes for? Um, that's my next few slides. Gosh. <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm happy for Garrett to ask questions. No one else? <laughs> there are, you start with that prefix, but the actual semantic of what the mbuff does later is determined by a couple of headers. So the first packet in the chain representing a packet is marked by setting a flag, which is the m packet header. That one holds all the metadata about the packet. The, if you are using external storage, so you can represent an mbuff, but you can actually point the data anywhere you want in the kernel, which is particularly useful if you've got something like NFS where you're reading blocks and you want to put that on the wire. You can, pre, you can allocate an mbuff and then point the mbuff at the block you just read from disk. And you, you can shove that down the network stack and it does the right thing. So um, you mark that semantic with the mx flag or you can actually use the rest of the mbuff for holding data. As I said before, mbuffs can get changed. So effectively, data is split over them. Um, here are the different types. The easiest one is just if it's got the header and the rest of the packets for data. The other one is external storage, as I described. The data is not in the mbuff itself, but somewhere else. Um, what happens in that situation is you've got that mbuff header, but it's followed by an mbuff x structure, which gives it all the metadata about where it needs to go. That includes when you're finished with this mbuff, how do you free it? How big is that um, data? Um, all that sort of stuff. However, there is a generic allocator for large network buffer data in the kernel, and that's something called an mbuff cluster. It's another set of pools. Um, up until November last year, there was one sized pool for all um, clusters, and that was two kilobytes. It's large enough to hold an Ethernet frame, um, plus a little bit of extra prefix stuff if the network card wants it. Um, as I said before, custom allocators use this header too. Now, um, because we only had a 2K cluster allocator previously, if you had a network card in the OpenBSD kernel that wanted to do jumbo frames, the network card driver was responsible for writing the allocator for the jumbo frames and referencing them from the mbuffs themselves. This is stupid for several reasons, which you can hear about in my talk on Friday. But the sneak peek is basically um, because of when the driver is initialized and when the driver is used, you're able to freely create huge amounts of memory when it's created, but you can't freely create lots of memory when it's used. So you have to pre-allocate your mbuffs, and you typically allocate the size of your ring plus some, which means you can fill your ring with jumbos, and when they're sent down the stack, you have some spare ones to replace on the ring. And the problem with that is if you have more in the stack than you have entries on your ring all of a sudden, you have to make a decision about what you're going to do with the packet you just took off. Drivers typically go, ah, oh, I can't get a new one. I'll just use the one I took off, which is stupid. As I said, I think. Um, the last one is the packet header, which is all the metadata. It contains all the extra information in the kernel that the kernel needs to know about the packet. And it includes, in the receive case, the interface it came in on, which is useful for policy, mbuff tags, the packet flags and stake, um, VLAN tags are encapsulated there, all that sort of stuff, anything you need to know. Um, if there's any spare space in that 256 bytes, you're free to use it for packet data. Now, people love diagrams, and Henning gave some awesome ones. This is what an mbuff looks like. <laughs> that's if you want to have everything in one mbuff, that's how you do it. You just get your 256 bytes, and you make it different colors. <laughs> if you want a packet, <laughs> that's how it works. So that whole thing is a single network packet. But in the kernel, it's represented as several data chunks, which are chained together using the mbuff headers. This is the most typical case, though, is where you have the x header, and it points down at the large allocation, which is typically 2K. Now, who wants to go for a tour through the network stack? Garrett's excited. <laughs> so what happens is the driver for the network card allocates an mbuff. Because it's receiving packets, it needs a lot of memory to receive into. Thank <laughs> you.
Um, so it allocates the mbuff, it allocates the cluster. What it then does is it maps the cluster into DMAable memory somewhere so that you can give a physical address in memory to the network card. It writes that physical address into a descriptor that the network card understands and it posts it to the chip. Typically that's done via a ring, but there's some really weird cases out there. Have you heard of the Atan SIC L1E? Yes. Have you heard of the Mirinet ones? They have no rings, you just write registers, it's great. Yeah. Um, as I said, OpenBSD has about 120 network drivers. Um, the ring is just a generalization. Please don't take it as gospel. So once we've given the network card the location of memory it can receive a packet into, and the hardware receives a packet, um, it then DMAs it, um, hopefully, completely oblivious to the CPU. It puts the packet into the memory in that thing there and it interrupts eventually. Um, yes. So it is now given back to the kernel via the CPU. So the interrupt pin is established, the kernel traps into the interrupt handlers and it eventually goes into the network card specific interrupt service routine. This is all kind of boring stuff. The important thing is it tells you this is the particular packet I just filled in and it gives some information about it. The most important one there is how long the packet is. Yeah, everything else you can live without pretty much, but you need to know how long it is. Um, smart network cards take the VLAN tag out for you so you don't have to do it yourself, which helps in some alignment situations. Um, some network cards do the IP protocol check something for you and all that sort of stuff. Um, it's the driver's responsibility to take it from the hardware's description and convert it into something that fits into the AMBUFF packet header. Everyone with me? Yes. Um, at the end of that um, translation process, the interrupt service routine hands the packet off to the actual network stack itself. Now, actually at the hardware interrupt level, we call other input with it. Um, other input does some rough classification. Basically, it looks for which type of protocol the other net packet's for. Um, because we care about IP more than anything else, I'll talk about that. It figures out that it's for IPv4, just because the Ethernet header says, cool, I'm IPv4, and it puts the packet on a linked list. It queues the packet on something called the IP intro queue, which is just a linked list of packets, effectively. After it does that, it then goes back and checks if there's any more packets on the ring, and it keeps dequeuing off the hardware and then putting on the IP input queue, effectively. After it's queued something on the IP input queue, it goes, I need you to service this queue, so it raises a software interrupt. Now, I think you would have seen something about those in John's talk. Kernels are all pretty much the same. Some are just different-ish. So after the hardware has been depleted of packets that are ready for it, it exits out of the interrupt handler and the stuff that lowers the priority in the kernel goes, cool, you've done all your hardware stuff, is there any software interrupts to do? So pretty much immediately after it's done all the dequeuing of hardware, it goes straight into softnet which is where the IP network stack runs completely. Um, it ends up in a function called IP intro, which is a software interrupt handler, and its job is to sit there pulling packets off the IP intro queue and giving them to IPv4 input, which is not a real function, it's actually IP input, like that. IP input is quite magical, and it's largely um, IP sex fault. <laughs> the, yeah. I'll skip that rant, but basically if you're forwarding the packet, you're going to have to check the checksums. After you make sure that the packet's valid, then you call PF test, which is basically where PFs run. You figure out if it's multicast IPsec, you check if it's a packet destined for the actual computer that the packet's inside of at the moment, or if we have to forward it. Um, we forward, otherwise we continue to local delivery and perhaps dropping it if it's not really that interesting. Um, IPv forward is the next stage, so now you've received the packet and you know you have to send it out further. You do the actual figuring out of where you want to send it to in a, a function called IP forward. Um, if the route points, uh, there's all sorts of magic in there as well. Most of this stuff is magical. I can explain it line by line, but at this point I don't think it really matters. Yeah, it, yeah. Um, 
Uh, it's probably Garrett won't admit to that. <laughs> well, it is true that a lot of the semantics here are shared between all things. Just if you get it right once, why do you have to change it, sort of thing? Um, so you, we've <laughs> called IP forward. We know which hosts on the network we want to send it on to next. Um, we call IP output to do the actual work. Now, IP output is responsible for making sure that the IP header is okay. If you weren't, if you were just sending a packet out um, rather than forwarding it, it would actually do the IP header generation and all that sort of stuff. Um, this, because it's forward, we're looking at the forwarding case. Actually, most of the functionality in IP output is skipped. Um, again, multicast broadcast IPsec, please ignore. Um, right at the bottom of IP output, it calls PF test again. So PF is run twice for every packet going through your box. It's important to no. know. Is that true in IP filter? I thought it was called once, which made it different. Anyway. Yeah. Um, IP output calls other output, which is the inverse of other input. It just puts the other net header on the front of it, and it's biggest job is to put the packet on the interface's send queue. Um, just like we have a queue coming from the hardware network handler into the software interrupt handlers, we have a queue that takes the packet from the software stack and puts it on the hardware again. Um, typically what happens as soon as you put it on the output queue, the IF send queue, you call the interface's start routine to push the packet out onto the wire um, basically immediately. And it does the same thing that the receive handlers do. It puts the cluster into DMAable memory, programs the descriptors, posts it to the chip, and forgets about it. Um, later on, the interrupt will fire, saying, I have finished with the packet. You can unmap the memory and free it effectively. So that's how the network stack works. Everyone kind of cool with that? Any questions at this point? Not yet. Um, now on to the actual performance tuning. That was very high level, but it's detailed enough for you to realize that some things happen in certain orders and some things happen twice and all that sort of stuff. Um, let's have a look at the changes we've been making. <sighs> IPsec. This isn't about making IPsec itself faster. Um, that's uh, someone else's problem, in my opinion. The problem with IPsec is um, even if you're not using it, you still have to check for it because how does the kernel know if you're not using it if you don't check for it? The problem is the things that match the IP packets to the um, security policy daemon entries, sorry, database entries, um, they actually took the mbuff, made copies of bits of it to get the headers in the right order for the policy um, checks to do, and it was ridiculously expensive. So the fortunate thing is if you, there's a counter of the number of security associations you have present in the kernel. So it's very easy to go, if the number of security associations in the kernel is zero, don't do the memory copies to get the keys in the right order. So you can just completely bypass the IPsec lookups if you're not using it. Now this is important for Henning because he hates IPsec. Um, he got to add maybe 10 lines and he got 5% of his CPU time back just by not doing these B copies. Cool. The other thing I noticed, um, this is something I did, which he likes to talk about, is a couple of years ago at the hackathon in Calgary, we did something outrageous and we actually profiled the kernel to see where the hotspots were. And something I noticed is this call to micro time, which tells you the current time in the system according to the hardware inside it. Now, on some machines that is ridiculously expensive, like ridiculously expensive. Um, I think part of the problem is we run on i386, which is supposed to encompass computers from the 486 up to the latest Nehalem type stuff. And the platform is supposed to provide the features that enable old code to still run on it. And the way we checked the time was by reading the old, old i8254 stuff. The problem with that is on modern systems, it's just not in there. So when you actually try to read the register, it traps into SSM, <coughs> runs some code to emulate it, and then traps back out again. And it's relatively quite slow. The clock is read um, several times as you go through the stack. So for every packet, we were 
um, stirring the random pool, and part of the process for stirring the random pool was to take the timestamp, chop the bits off the end of that timestamp, and add it to the entropy pool. So every packet going through, we took the time. Every time we um, allocated or, no, every time we returned something to the memory allocators, like the pools, which happens quite a lot when you forward a packet and you finish transmitting it, it has to go back in the pool, we took a timestamp. Now the reason for that was, like I said, to stir the random pool. Um, pools were timestamped, so you allocate these 256 byte chunks of memory, but they are, um, pools manage them in terms of pages in the kernel. When you put um, items back in the pool, it timestamped them, so when a full page became free, it knew which one was used the longest ago so to make it a better candidate for freeing. But if you think about it, if you have completely free pages, they're all as good as each other as candidates for returning to UVM. So we just turned that code off. It is stupid, we just got rid of it. And surprisingly, the results of this were massive improvements. Um, when I was doing this, I was testing on Dell PowerEdge SC 1435s with the Tahuti 10 gig NICs, and I was getting 500 megabits per second. Just by get, um, getting rid of the pool time stamping and by changing it so we do the stirring per interrupt, not per packet, I quadrupled the throughput of the system. Cool. The other thing I noticed is, you remember how I said when you're in IP output, you put the pack, um, at the end of other output, you put the packet on the hardware interface's send queue? The stupid thing with that code was as soon as you enqueued it, you had no context of when the last time you had actually called the driver start routine to put it on the wire. So you did best effort and just called it immediately. So what you were actually doing was queuing a packet and then sending it immediately. Queuing the packet, sending it immediately. Queuing the packet and sending it immediately. Um, I made a change which made the interface's start routine only get called at the end of softnet. So instead of calling it once per packet, I was calling it once for as many packets as I just processed in response to a hardware interrupt before. So instead of going IF start 30 times, we're doing IF start once. Um, it works for exactly the same reason that interrupt mitigation works. If you can avoid calling into a function, you avoid the setup costs of going into a function, all that sort of stuff. Um, on some chips, some really bad chips, we got 5% of the CPU time back, which is cool. Now, PF. <laughs> Has anyone heard of PF? Cool. I like PF. Um, it's short for packet filter because we are awesome at naming stuff. Just like SSHD is the secure shell daemon, PF is the packet filter. Um, it's now quite a significant chunk of the network stack. It's a pretty big feature, even though we don't like talking about features. It is a reason some people run OpenBSD, so it deserves some focus. Um, we wanted to make it re faster for the same reasons that we wanted to make the rest of the system faster. It's in the pipeline, it takes CPU time. How can we make it not take CPU time? So I have to do a quick e explanation of how PF works. PF is evaluated twice for a packet going through the system, once on the way in and once on the way out. Um, I think that is different to IP filter. I can't back that up, but I'm pretty sure IP filter is only called once in the forwarding path. Um, so automatically PF is doing twice the work that IP filter was doing. Um, it's made up of three components, user land, boring. Um, it is responsible for loading a rule set into the kernel um, and we have a state table. So what PF test does is the first time it gets a packet into it, we try to match it against an existing state. So what it does is it gets some values out of the mbuff a lot more efficiently than the IPsec code ever did. Don't know why. Um, it builds a key, looks it up in a red-black tree. If it can't find it in the red-black tree, um, it will fail and fall through to the rules. Now, the rule set is actually the slow path. It's roughly ON because um, it iteratively goes through the rule set. So if you have 4,000 rules, on average, it's going to evaluate 2,000 of them unless you order your list, your rules crazily. Um, ON is rough because there are some optimizations in there and there's ways you can short circuit evaluation and all sorts of funky stuff like that. But it is still true that it is slower than the um, state tree. So we not only create states for the security advantages, but we also create it for the performance advantages. 
Um, the security of it is another talk topic. Um, is everyone clear on how PF works? Not clear on PF, how PF works? So you enter it, you look up the state table. If there's not an existing connection about it, you fall through to the rule set and try to create a state so you can cache the cost of the rule set evaluation effectively. Everyone's cool with that? Yeah. Um, a stealth firewall is basically an Ethernet bridge that does IP filtering between it. We run PF on bridges effectively. Um, I kind of have a problem with the idea of stealth firewalls because if your firewall is actually doing something, you're going to see a difference between if it was there and not there. So I don't know how they can say it's supposed to be stealth. However, um, what's supposed to happen if you're sending directly to a host on the same network segment? If you send a packet with a corrupt checksum, the end host is supposed to just drop it. It doesn't acknowledge it or anything like that. It doesn't send ICMP redirects or ICMP connection refused or anything like that. It just drops the packet on the floor because it is corrupt. You don't know what it's supposed to mean. You don't know which bit of it's invalid. You don't know which port it's supposed to be talking to. You just drop it on the floor. However, if there's a PF rule which this packet falls into that says when you receive this packet send, we're blocking this type of packet send an error message back to the sender. Um, the problem with that was we didn't check if the checksum on the packet was valid, so we just blindly sent an ICMP or a return RS, um, an RST back to the sender. And all of a sudden they could figure out there's a firewall in the middle of it because I'm getting RSTs when I shouldn't have been getting RSTs. So the solution to that was to checksum every single packet going into PF every single packet. And it was like that for probably five years. Um, the solution to this was only do the checksumming when you know you have to respond to the packet as if you were or weren't doing the checksumming. Um, by not doing the checksumming in all cases, we got another 7% of the CPU time back. In most cases, the will be doing checksumming for you anyhow. That's correct, but you have to choose to respect the pack flags on it. I, we don't have a semantic to say the network card can do checksumming and it failed. We only have whether the checksum passed or failed. Yeah, we'd need more bits. So we might have to go to a uint 16 on the flags or something. <coughs> so it's pessimistic in that case. The network card did the right thing, but the kernel's just double checking. Um, either way, we don't do as much work anymore. As you saw before, PF is called twice for packets through the box. Um, between those two calls, though, it needs to remember some stuff. The other interesting thing is PF is no longer just for applying packet filtering policy. It's also a policy engine for other things in the system. For example, Alt-Q, you can also reassign packets. Um, you can put them into different routing domains within the same kernel and stuff like that. So there's information about a packet that PF has to record on the packet. Now, as you saw before with the Lego blocks, there isn't much space in the <laughs> headers to store that sort of stuff. So the generic solution within the kernel is something called mbuff tags. Now, these are just little chunks of memory that the kernel allocates and sticks on a linked list hanging off the mbuff. The problem with those is they're variably sized, so we can't use a pool backend. So the PF stuff was allocated with malloc. Now, this is dumb for two reasons. One, malloc is really slow, and two, um, all the network stack operates in an interrupt context and you can't reliably get memory from malloc without process context. So we were doing an unreliable, very slow operation. Stupid, right? So <coughs> as I said, it comes from malloc and it was a huge performance issue. So rather than allocating stuff for PF all the time, we bit the bullet and just put the stuff in the packet header. <laughs> so even if your system doesn't have PF, like you don't compile it in, you're actually going to have a structure in the front of your mbuffs for PF to use. But why would you run OpenBSD without PF? It's on by default. <laughs> There's no more malloc, but we lose some bytes. Um, we compromised there, though. We got some back by removing um, other unused members of the mbuff packet headers. Um, Strange thing here, um, those values were cached values for other parts of the network stack and it turned out to be easier just to recalculate what we were caching there and it actually turned out faster. 
because the cost of hitting memory is less than the cost of computing it sometimes. Sometimes. So what happens is if you're running a bridge, <laughs> we basically doubled throughput because we're not doing the memory management we were. Cool, eh? <laughs> Um, unfortunately, that's the most obvious stuff in the profiling output, so we've got no low-hanging fruit left. Um, this was the stage we were up to at the beginning of... What year is it? <laughs> 2008. Yeah, 2008 was about the time that the Henning and a guy called Ryan McBride sat down and figured out that they have to re-architect stuff to get some performance improvements. Um, there are a lot of other things we can do, but um, time is a limiting factor in all these things. The first thing that we, well, I can't claim credit for any of the following work. The first thing that Henning and Ryan decided to attack was the structure of the PF state table. Now, as I said before, PF is stateful, it tracks connections. Um, this is pretty obvious for TCP because you have a very good concept of sequence, you have a very good concept of a flow between two endpoints, you have your TCP windows and your sequence checks and all that sort of stuff. Um, it turns out it's good for ICMP as well because um, so you can make sure that the reply you get for your ICMP state is what you expect. So if you send an echo request through, your state can make sure that you only get an echo reply back, things like that. It's kind of cool. UDP, it doesn't really make as much sense for because there's no state between packets, but we still create them for the replies to come through faster than if the rule set evaluation applied. Um, it also makes a lot of sense because we don't have to provide rules for the return packets. We provide rules for the creation of the connection, um, which is a lot more secure than having to have rule sets that allow all packets for any possible replies you want to do. So you, you get security in, out of this. Um, the thing is, PF as a packet filter is also capable of modifying the packet, so it can do network address translation, which means it has to um, rewrite IP headers effectively, and it has to know what it has to rewrite those headers to. So you have to store the addresses you're going to receive, and it has to know which one you're going to write, rewrite. James? You've got five minutes. Crap! I'm the last one, right? Yes. I've got forever. <laughs> We also had interface bound states, so you can actually tie the states created to the interfaces they arrived on and they must stay there. If you get them on another interface, you just drop them. The problem with that, though, um, is... The problem with NAT is we had to store three addresses instead of two. And the problem with the... the interface bound states is we had to create separate state trees for each of the interfaces that you checked before you checked the global one for your floating states. So. The first, the re-architecting was to <coughs> split this up. So instead of having the state with all your different addresses, including the ones that you might want to NAT to, so even if you weren't using NAT, you still had space there for the third address, um, we split them up. So the red-black tree is only populated with the addresses you expect, and then they point to another structure, which are the states. The states then point back at the keys. It kind of looks like that. <laughs> I'm really proud of the bottom right, where I saved them eight bytes. <laughs> and we have a cloud on the diagram, like every good... Where's this? It's a clown. <laughs> this is the more formal one. So you have your state key. It's got the basically the addresses. It has the family, um, the ports, um, the protocol. They point at state items, which point at the actual states. Um, now, we, because of this, because we now have the state keys separate to the actual states, it means we can do some funky stuff. We can reuse the state keys. So if you have two states with the same addresses, you can just use the same key. And instead of having two state entries in the red-black tree, you just point it at a list of states, if that makes any sense. The trick there is you put the interface bound ones states first in the list and you put the floating ones last in the list. So if you get that logic at the bottom right, that means you can just eval keep evaluating until you hit the most specific route, your um, most specific state you're actually interested in. Make sense? So we saved memory there and we got rid of the extra um, 
state tables. Yep. Um, the cool thing is the state is all around. The state actually points to two sets of these addresses, though. Um, there's the stack side and the wire side. So the addresses you expect coming off the wire, it will look up in the red-black tree, but then it will link to the addresses you expect on the stack side. So if you do NAT and they're different, you know. Does that make sense? Everyone's nodding their head, but I'm not convinced. <laughs> like when, when you get a packet into the system, it's got the address family and the addresses and all that sort of stuff off the wire, right? So that's the key that's actually populated in the red black tree and it's the one you match on. That set of addresses will point to the state, but the state also points at the addresses that the kernel expects when you enter the stack. And if they're different, it rewrites them, okay? The cool thing is it does that comparison based on the pointers to instances of the addresses. So it's an integer comparison rather than this structure comparison. It's a pointer comparison rather than a structure comparison. So if the addresses are the same on both the stack and wire side, they're actually the same object. So you just compare the pointers and go, cool, I do nothing, fall through the NAT. If they're not a NAT situation, if it is a NAT situation, you have different instances of the addresses on each side. So you do the point a comparison and you know you have to actually read the values and rewrite the headers. <sighs> cool, eh? <laughs> <laughs> it really did speed things up. <laughs> but Henning's crap at doing accounting on this stuff. Um, the next thing is As I said before, <laughs> the packet goes through PF twice. And by definition, the address going into the stack, so the addresses on the stack side of the PF test, they have to be the same as what comes out the other side. So instead of just going, are the addresses the same? Because traditionally, when you call PF test on the outgoing side, you actually have to do the red black tree lookup again. If you can cache the relationship between the stack keys, then you can avoid doing the red-black tree lookup on the other side. It's pretty cool. Basically, we have the states on the inbound side and the outbound side point at each other so that you can get rid of the red-black tree lookup on the outgoing side. So it's easy now. Um, because of that, we got 10% of our CPU time back. So now we have the notion of flows in the kernel. So we keep track of a connection between instances of PF and we avoid all the lookups in the path for a forwarded packet. It's pretty cool. However, there's other subsystems in the kernel that need to keep track of state on their own. Examples are TCP and UDP. Um, if you have TCP and UDP going to the local computer, there has to be a representation of the socket within the kernel and those are the protocol control blocks. So you get UD, uh, TCP sent to a specific port on your machine. It enters the list of PCBs and it finds the most appropriate match. Um, now that we're linking PF states together, the idea is we can now link PF states to TCP sessions and UDP sessions on the local system. Um, pretty much we're doing what we did before. We check if the point is set. If it's not, then we go fall back to the normal PCB lookup. If there is a, if we manage to find a PCB and we know that the MBuff has a PF state associated with it, thanks to the packet headers, then we just link it up and forever. from then on, we just cache. The PCB and the state must look at each other because they're actually <laughs> um, completely independent notionally. So you can flush the state table, but you still want to keep your TCP connections running. So they point at each other so that if one goes away, it knows what to tell on the other side and you avoid the null DREF. Um, on to something different. Minus two minutes. Ah, oh. billions. <laughs> yeah, um, TCP does state um, um, TCP connection tracking, so it makes sure that the TCP state moves through the state machine in the right order and the right values. Doesn't jump state, so you can't get spoofed um, flags on things. It also makes sure that the windows are against expected values. Um, 
But for this to work, your machine has to see all the packets. So it has to see both the packets sent to the host and the packets received from the host. So it knows when to update the windows in the state. This is, a, unfortunately, <laughs> you can't guarantee that a host is going to see both sides of the connection. So if you've got multipath routing, you might receive the replies on a different leg of your routing cluster than what you sent it on. Henning wrote a BGP daemon, so obviously he does routing. He does have multiple boxes and he does get packets not coming in on the right leg. So his way of coping with that was to write a sloppy tracker. We were originally going to call it the net filter tracker, but that was considered bad form. <laughs> <laughs> so we settled on slot sloppy. It basically does away with the um, TCP window checks. It only makes sure that the state machine moves forward as expected on one side. However, I really don't recommend you use it because one of the really big um, strengths of PF is the fact that it does really good checking of the TCP windows. So the full state tracking is 326 lines of code. The sloppy one is 69. However, it's because you do this full state checking when you receive the packet, surely you can just skip the full state tracking session stuff on the outgoing leg. Um, so Henning did auto sloppy. <laughs> Where you do your full-blown tr state tracking on the inbound side and you remember the fact that it's okay on the outbound side. Unfortunately, it made things slower and he doesn't quite know why. Um, his theory is that we're limited by memory access times, not the code execution times. So the fact that you're skipping the um, full-blown tracker on the outgoing stuff means you're now waiting on memory accesses to complete to go on to the next stage of the stack. So um, there's no advantage to doing auto sloppy, so we just threw it away. Um, his future plans are to cache the route lookups because IP forward is now more expensive than the firewalling checks. So he'll basically tie a state to a route entry. Um, the problem is you can't go the other way because you can have 270,000 routes in your kernel now and it's getting worse. And the other problem is states point at the same route all the time. If you've only got one default route, you're not going to have a list of states in the route that it points back to sort of thing. Your memory would just go completely disappear. Um, so you can cache which route you're going to use. The problem is routes change all the time, especially if you're peering. So he has this mechanism where instead of deleting the state when it changes, he just invalidates it and unlinks it from the radix tree. The next time the state tries to use it, it notices it's invalid and it reevaluates the route and caches the new value. The more specific problem is if you have a default route and you add a more specific one, you have to invalidate the less specific route so the state caching knows to use the new one. So basically, when you put a more specific route in, it deletes all the least spe less specific ones and puts the new ones in again so that the caching fixes things up. Um, <laughs> future work. Um, in the future, we need to profile more. Um, it's really hard to say something's causing all the slowdown if you can't look at individual components of the system and score them in separately from each other. So. It's surprisingly hard to get OpenBSD guys to profile. Just, I don't know why. Um, I have some profiling output from the firewalls here at work, and there's some hotspots I can see already. Why, why you because your license doesn't let us. Sorry. That's another discussion. <laughs> <laughs> so we need to do more profiling. Um, I have noticed recently that IP forward is really expensive because it does the IPsec thing, <laughs> which is... <laughs> That's Henning's slide. If you look on the name tag, it says Henning. <laughs> yeah. um, sorry I went over time. I'm not very performant at <laughs> talks, obviously. But does anyone have any questions? I wish. I know we've got GProf, which is very coarse, and about 25% of the CPU time goes to M count. It sucks. Can you do O profile for me? Uh, it's easy. Oh, <laughs> yeah. it's easy you done? I'm really lazy. <laughs> <laughs> Any other questions? <laughs> right. right. Well, thank you, Dave. <laughs> right. That
concludes today. Thank you very much. Um, please hand in your uh, evaluation forms. Um, bring them down to me or give them to other James who's sitting there. Waiting there. And we'll see you again tomorrow. Uh, don't forget to bring your name tag back. Um, otherwise, we'll write back to you. Yeah.